I put together something called the Growth Exit and Legacy Plan for essentially practice owners or people who are thinking about practice owners or people who are advising practice owners. The key to the, to the whole process is planning. And it may seem sort of obvious, but I do a lot of this work. I run into a lot of people who have not done the planning. They're aware of the planning, but it's like there's a business writer who said, there are a lot of people now who turn 60, and they go, how did that happen? Who's responsible for this? I want to talk to who's in charge. Who let this happen? How did this happen? I'm 60 years old. And that happens, it's happening more and more frequently because time just flies. So, so the planning is really, really critical. I'm trying to really emphasize that. One of the analogies I, I talk to people about, and someone got a chuckle out of this earlier. Has everyone taken a vacation in the past 12 months? Or did you put some thought into where you're going to go, where you're going to stay, how you're going to get there? Mm -hmm. uh, probably a fair amount of thought. My wife plans our vacations, and it's like a second job for her. She, mm -hmm. she goes crazy planning. The flights. That's part of the fun, too. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking people to do is the amount of time you spend on your vacation, spend at least that much planning for the practice and, or advice to the owners. Mm -hmm. Put that much time into planning for the practice every year. It's not a once and done. It's a process. It's not an event. A lot of the things <coughs> are, are somewhat self-evident. Why is planning good? Well, at least the stability, continuity, and security. And those things can all lead to value, greater value in, in your practice. Why does greater value matter? Because for a lot of people who are, are owners or, or become an owner, at the end of the day, you'd like to monetize that value. You'd, you'd like to convert that value into cash at some point in time. Which is a good segue into, well, what's a practice worth? If you asked five people who are in the business of valuing practices, you'd get probably at least six or seven answers on what, what a practice is worth. So I'll give you my view. I've been working pretty hard to convince people that I'm right, of course. And no one's convinced me I'm wrong yet, but uh, everyone else could probably say the same thing. From my perspective, you have to look at today's environment and who are the prospective buyers. Or if, you know, if you're an associate and, and you're a prospective buyer, odds are, and, and I've found this to be pretty much true, very few people go into veterinary medicine to become rich. It tends not to be the case. And very few wealthy people become veterinarians. <laughs> I've kind of found that, not an official scientific poll, but I found that pretty much to be true. So if someone's going to buy a practice, where's the money going to come from? You're going to have to borrow. So the practice is going to have to be able to generate enough extra cash to pay the debt for the buyer to buy it. Now that's not necessarily a new concept. What a lot of people who are doing valuations do is something that they did 25, 30, 40 years ago. They said, okay, this is how it's going to work. We're going to have this sweat equity concept, and the buyer is going to work for free. And if they work for free, there's enough cash to support a really high valuation. Uh, there are, I can't tell you how many people come in with that approach, and it used to be fairly common I think in part when you had people coming out of school with maybe a little bit less debt, but now people are coming up with a lot of debt. You've got a very high cost of living in, in New England. So people can't afford to work for nothing. Maybe they did 30, 40 years ago, uh, and some people did. But that valuation technique just to me is dead wrong. You, you've got to give people a fair salary so that they can pay their bills, so that they can pay their student loans, so that they can pay for their mortgage, so they can buy food and clothing and live. You've got to be able to have a fair compensation built into it. 
So what's the profitability of the practice after the fair compensation? That's that the profitability that's going to be able to be used to pay the debt service. And whatever debt service that cash will support, or whatever debt that that cash will support, that's the value. The way I do it, it's not overly complicated. It's not a $12,000 process. It's pretty easy to look at what are the numbers, where are we? Now, unfortunately, some people, many people have a practice where after you run that exercise, it's break even, pretty much, pretty much break even. So what's that practice worth? What's, you're not going to give it away for nothing. Obviously, but why would someone pay money and essentially then have less l left over after they pay the debt service, have less money than if they just worked as an associate somewhere? So part of what I'm encouraging people to do is to put a plan together to grow the profitability of the practice. Put a plan together to think about your costs, but also your revenues. The profession is somewhat changing. The world is, is changing. Uh, you've got social media, people are using social media, people are using websites in their practices. What are you doing to, to change with the times? In, in many cases, it makes sense to bring in a younger vet who's on top of some of the, the changes, who might have some other creative ideas. Bring them in, get them involved. To, and contribute to well, where should we be going? What should, what should we be doing in the community? What should we be doing in, in the practice? Get some fresh ideas in there. That can often really, really help uh, in, in terms of growing the practice and getting people involved in the future of the practice. And if you have people who, who are interested in, in that, um, giving them an ownership interest can help. You know, too often, there are very talented people out there who are in a practice who would like to become an owner and they feel that there's not an ownership opportunity where they are. So next thing you know, they're off buying a practice some, somewhere else. Right, exactly. There you go. Bring back into the, <laughs> preach into the choir. <laughs> the, 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 the last group, there were two people who had purchased a practice and it was both of them the same thing. They were in another practice didn't feel they had an ownership opportunity and they went and bought practice somewhere else. It's not necessarily ownership, but allowing input in how things are run and the direction of the practice. I think that's what keeps associates as well. The last practice I worked, I never would have left because I felt like I was part of the team. All our input was incorporated into, you know, the future. It, it really made a difference. Right. Yeah, that really does keep Yeah. <laughs> well, it had nothing to do with that. Because okay. the, I'll tell you why I left because it's interesting. It's interesting what happened is the owner gave the practice to a manager. And that manager changed the way everything was done and it was no longer like that. And every vet, every associate has left since then. There were six vets there. We've all left mm -hmm. because of that over time. You know? So it's not just we're looking for ownership, but we're looking for input. And the thing is, a lot of that input is valuable. We had several new graduates bring on board new drugs that we weren't familiar with. And we think of how many new drugs are they every year. It's hard to keep up with, right? They bring up great stuff all the time. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And uh, uh, perhaps someone that doesn't There's acknowledge so that things. is really shooting themselves in the foot. Exactly. As as that's, that's exactly right. So. so putting the plan together where you're planning systematically to do that, to bring some younger people and get them involved. I actually think that a practice manager can be a great asset to a practice, but it's a matter of getting the right practice manager. It's like anything else. There are different styles out there, different styles work in different environments. But a lot of people who come out of veterinary school, they went to school to be vets, yeah. not to manage practice. It's not necessarily their strength. It's not necessarily what they're interested in. And when they're managing a practice, it's taking away from their productivity, the things that they might otherwise be doing. And I'm not saying abdicate the management, but getting involved in some of the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, management issues, you're better off having a practice manager who does that. Who, that's their passion. That's what their skill is. Let them do that. Let the practice manager do that. But don't abdicate. Don't just then walk away and say, oh, now everything's hunky-dory, because you bring up a good example. It may not 
work. You can't end up with the opposite result. So you do have to still supervise it. But it's uh, something, a practice that I like to see on a pretty regular basis, if possible, to get a good, strong practice manager in. Failure to plan, I see this just too often. If there's a disaster, you're, you're going to lose value. And if you, at the end of the day, and, and someone just said this to me, that their, their parent is an older vet, and they are reaching despair, that they're, they're become desperate, because they don't have a plan in place for their exit. As much as it's important to have a plan for growing the practice and keeping it vibrant and bringing young people in, you also have to plan for, well, what's my exit? When am I going to exit? There are a lot of studies that have shown that people who plan their exit make more money on the exit than people who don't. And since we haven't come across anyone who's immortal, one way or another, every practice owner is going to exit. Vertically or horizontally, you're going to exit. So why not have it be on the best terms? And, and preserve the value. And, and value can be measured a number of different ways. In the plan that, that I advise people to, to develop, the last line is, the last word is legacy. Many people, their relationships in their practice, they're very important relationships, and, and it's something that's tied into the community. And what's the legacy going to be in the community of, of the practice? So, so think about that, the exit, uh, and the exit has an impact on that legacy. This is just a, a quick chart that emphasizes that to maximize the value, you need to have a plan. One of the things that I handed out was a summary, of, uh, an outline of the growth, exit, and legacy plan that I encourage people to, to do. I can send it to you. Uh, we're not going to go through it. I can send it to you in Word. If you're interested, just let me know. Uh, but that's a template that I've developed to help people think about what should this plan look like, how do we put it together. So we can sit here and everybody nod their head and say, oh yeah, this is great, we need to do this. But what happens? What happens to everybody? Everybody meets the alligator. When you're up to your butt in alligators, it's hard to remember your initial objective was to drain the swamp. <laughs> so don't forget to drain the swamp. That's the biggest message that I can leave with people. You really need to take time every year, plan your vacation, review your plan for, your, for the practice. Now there are a number of things to do on the on the plant exit side. What are things that to look at? There are several different ways to do it. What I like the most is to end up with the current owner being at 51 percent. A more senior associate at 33 percent, and a younger associate at 16 percent. Now these, of course, would be people who have some interest in, in ownership, but there are a number of people who want to come in, do their job, and go home. They never want to be owners. That's fine. You need people like that. Not everybody can be an owner, but there are people who want to be owners. The 51, 33, 16 gives you a situation where the current owner retains control. At the 51%, they're always going to be able to outvote the other two. So they still control the practice. But they're getting 51% of the profit at that point. Again, if it's a profitable practice, 51% of a bigger profit is better than 100% of no profit. It's always, always going to be true. Now you have two people behind you. Either of them could end up being the ultimate owner. Your plan would be that the 30% person would probably become the owner. But sometimes that, that doesn't necessarily happen. Things happen. People move away or uh, whatever. Some tragedy befalls them. 
So you, you're not putting all your eggs in one one basket. If things go as everyone hopes, your 33% person goes to 67%, and your 16% person goes to 33%, and then the 67% person sells to the younger person. So you you've got a plan where the young a younger person has a seat at the table to, as an owner to make some contribution. And you've got then the middle person who hopefully is going to be the, be the successor. It's good to have a timeline in there so that people have reasonable expectations. But that to me is a structure that I've, that I've seen work. Uh, you're not going to just get those people in tomorrow. It does take some trial and error to get the, the right mix of people. What I don't recommend is ever to have a 50-50 scenario, because then no one's in, in control and you have a deadlock. And probably at least a third of the time, the deadlock scenario leads to the practice being dissolved. And then the only people who make money are the lawyers. I'm a lawyer, but I don't do that kind of work, so I don't, I don't benefit from the, from the, the tragedies. Uh, and it's terrible. It's terrible to see vibrant practices end up just going down too because the owners can't make a decision. I, I'm a firm believer in that there's always got to be one person with at least 51% to, to make the ultimate decisions. Another option for a lot of people is a sale to a corporate buyer. But we all know they're out there. They're good for some people, they're not good for other people. I'm not here to make any judgment about it. Um, in many cases, the corporate buyer is, is either the only buyer or, or you know, certainly the right buyer for, for a practice. So I wouldn't discount the, the corporate buyer uh, as a possibility. A lot of, there are a lot of people who don't ever want a corporate buyer that are concerned about what that might mean to the culture of the practice. That's, that's fine. My 51, 33, 16 scenario will will accommodate the, the non-corporate buyer scenario, or you know it could be just 67, 33. It's not necessarily cast in stone, but my suggestion is that the current owner never go below 51. You never want to be a minority owner in, in a practice that you want to exit from, because then you won't have any control over what the ultimate exit looks like. So I'm, I'm getting a sense from the activity outside that it must be, well, we have to be going that long. We don't have a red light that says, okay, time to switch rooms, you know, time, time to play musical chairs. Um, so if the, flip, flip the, if the current, console. if the solo practitioner, so if you bring somebody along and then make that transition at that point where you don't have 51%, you are no longer, at that point you, transition, then you're no longer in control, as opposed to planning it so that you've got that decreasing and you're still trying to. Is that part of it? I'm not sure that I understand. Oh, because right now if it's solo practice, yeah. so if you wanted to keep a hand in it after. What, what I recommend to people who are solo practitioners to bring somebody in, put a definite timeline together. There has to be a definite timeline. There can't be a definite timeline. And, and you can leave the door open to practicing, mm -hmm. but what I like to see is uh, never owning a non-controlling interest. So there's some people feel that they can end up holding 20%, and that someday they'll get paid for that 20%. And too often what happens is they never get paid for that 20%. It ends up becoming relatively worthless. So, if you want to get the value as, as a current owner, if you want to get the value for your practice, you've got to set the terms when you have at least 51%. There's a prominent CPA started a big CPA firm in town. I met with him in Washington, D.C. probably 20 years ago when he was planning the exit from his 
CPA practice. And he was very proud of the plan that he put together. And he was going to get money over, over time, over an extended period of time, but he was turning control over to the, the heirs. And within five years after that, the heirs told him he wasn't getting any more money. And not only that, so they were cutting him off, but they were changing the name of the firm. There were three names in the firm. They were changing the name just to his name. So he couldn't even have his name. And it became very stressful. They all hired lawyers. The lawyers got rich. And he ended up passing away, unfortunately, in, in a, not in a place where he wanted to be. So relying on the heirs to do the right thing, whether they be children or, or buyers, uh, is a strategy that I don't recommend. That's, that's why I put it, put it in stone when you have control and do it in a way where you've got some comfort that that's actually going to happen. Uh, and I really do like the, the practice solutions opportunity because they, they understand the profession. They're very fair rates, they've got great rates, and you can have cash buyers. It just it has to cash flow, as we talked about before. As long as the cash flows, you can have a cash buyer. And they will find, if, if you have a younger associate, or if you're a younger associate, and you want to buy that 33% or 60%, they'll finance that acquisition. You don't have to self-finance. So that, that's something that I strongly recommend. If you can find, if you're a practice owner, you can find a good, a good associate who has some interest in ownership, sell them part of the practice. Might be 10%, might be 16%, whatever the percentages that you can get comfortable with sell them a part of that practice before they leave and buy a practice somewhere else and you've got to start over again. Too many lost opportunities in the profession from the I can see. I think it's going to get worse. I agree 100%. He's because, I'm mean 100%, but I can tell you in this area, very few practices change hands that way, almost none. I can yeah, think that's of right. the last 10 practices I looked at to purchase, they all had associates that purchased in buying and none of them had associates. It's just not done that way. It's going to take a look. The best way is because if, and then my current employer offered me this a few years ago, but we didn't have anyone to guide us through the process. But if you have an associate who's buying in, they're going to be much more vested interest in how the practice is run, how it's doing, profitable, versus an associate that just does their job and leaves. It makes a huge difference. But I tell you, there's nothing more frustrating as an associate to build up a practice for somebody and then have them sell it underneath your feet because that happens all the time. It just happened that to a friend of mine. She worked in a practice for 16 years. She would have bought in under her foot. You know, it just got sold to a different person. That's how it goes most of the time. But you're exactly right. And the other problem is, you know, if you're looking at a practice, you know, you're looking at more than a million dollars for a profitable practice. That's no not individual can, no one person no one person can afford it. that. And I can tell you, yeah. my husband and I have good finances. You can't get financing for that. No matter how easy they say it is, there's no money down, all this big deal, it is not easy to get financing. So I know a, a practice owner that I've been working for for many, many years, he has six associates, he said, over my dead body will BCA come in here. But you know what? Right. He doesn't know what his other options are. Right. There's it may no not one exist. individual that can buy it. You know, when he bought it, it was a nice little farmhouse and a yeah. shed associated with the farmhouse, but nowadays he can't do it anymore. And if you go on bid, there's all, all yeah. kinds of lawsuits where veterinarians sold their practices to BCA, and now they yeah. have to sue to get their money or whatever yeah. two years so later. It's, it's a, this is the way we need to go, but it's very hard to get people to do that. It's, it, the message has to it's go. It's a win-win for the associate and the owner. That, that's exactly right. And that's part of the reasons that I'm, I'm doing the program, is to try to get the word out to the existing the owners. They say in the new graduates, though, are going to have so much debt when they graduate. That is a big thing. They'll they're actually going to have to start their own practices immediately. Yeah. Because that's the only way they're going to be able to make what they're, well, what I, they're worth. I, I don't, don't agree with that, quite frankly. Uh, Dave and I are actually talking about the situation right now where mm. the, the potential value of this practice is between seven and a half and eight and a half million dollars. One owner isn't going to be able to, to finance that. Right. But I've come up with a program that will allow one owner, and there's an owner that, that they have in mind, one vet, the younger vet, to buy it over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And if they go through with the program, if they were to sell to a corporate buyer at eight and a half million, the 
the seller would put $6.8 million in their pocket after tax. If they go through the program that I've developed for them, they will end up at $9.2 million in their pocket after tax rather than 6.8. And you will have one vet, individual owner, will have purchased the practice and have it paid off in 15 years. Mm, that's awesome. Now, that's, there's some ifs in there. There's certainly some, some risk. But it can be done. Yeah. One vet with no money down can buy, over time, over time can buy a $7.5 million practice. There has to be a profitability. But it can be done. The problem is, you're exactly right, people aren't aware of it, they're not thinking about it, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing these programs, is to try to get the word out. People think about this a little bit different way. Think about drugs. Think about putting some of these things in place to make this happen so that you're not left in despair when you're 75 years, 85, 95 years old. I think the bigger problem is of the other five vets you work with, how many of them want to own the practice? Very few. Yeah. But I because it's so difficult, is. not because they, if if it was a buy-in over time, that's something they consider. But it's, it's young mothers, you know, like mm -hmm. I was myself. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not thinking of ownership at that point. But if they had the opportunity to buy in over time, that would be something that would be more open to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, well, I don't want to stop and buy a practice all out and get all this, take on all this debt at that point in my life because a lot of them still have debt from other things. So <laughs> But they could probably, if they had the opportunity to buy 10% or 15%, much more interested. 100% financed, right? Dave, you would do that for the right buyer. I mean, that's the way law practices are changed, dental practices, CPA firms. They, that's all they, how they all change hands. Veterinarians are unique in that they just close up shop and then someone else goes in. And usually profit goes down immediately, right? That's what happens. Well, it, it depends. I do a lot of work actually in the dental community, the CPA world some in the medical and a pretty fair amount of the veterinary community. <coughs> there are differences all the way around. Uh, it's got to be based upon cash flow. If someone comes in and uses the valuation techniques from the 50s, mm -hmm. and they are, <laughs> and a lot of them are, that practice will not change hands mm -hmm. because the value will be one that is not sustainable. Exactly. That's part of the problem, is getting the word out to the sellers that it's no longer 1950. You can't use valuation techniques from 1950. You have to use valuation techniques from 2012, looking at the current state of the economy, looking at the state of the, of the buyers that are out there. It has to cash flow. Mm -hmm. and if it cash flows, then Dave will be happy, you'll be happy, and if the seller can develop a profitable practice, they'll be happy. Mm -hmm. The $7.5 million practice that we're talking about, or, or eight and a half million, that practice grosses four and a half million. Now, finding a practice that's worth one times gross is somewhat rare these days to begin with. One that's four and a half million dollar practice worth seven and a half million. Why is that? That's because it's very profitable. It's all about the profitability. It's all about the cash flow. And if, if you can get the sellers to understand that and understand why that has to be the case, and have people thinking about Cash flow is good. And people kind of know it's ca cash flow is good anyway, but it's even more important now than it ever was. Focus on on that to a certain extent. Don't have it be the complete driving force because you'll end up probably not with the culture of practice that you, you want to start out with. But think about it. Think about that cash flow. How how can you get the cash flow to be as healthy as possible and still retain your culture? That will drive the value, and that will then give the seller the numbers that they're looking for. The seller has control over it. They've got control over the practice. If they can get the cash flow to be a healthy number, they will get the, the selling number, the valuation that they're looking for. But they will have created something that people can afford to buy. That's, that's part of the problem, is that the people doing some of the valuations are creating numbers that sellers can't afford. Mm -hmm. Well, then it's not worth that. What's something worth that never sells? Nothing. Someone asked me before, well, who do I favor? Who do I try to jack up the selling price if I'm representing the seller or depress it if I'm representing the, the buyer? And my answer is, what I think is important is getting a deal done that people feel is fair. So I really focus on trying to get the parties to a number that 
works pretty much for the buyer and the seller. And I keep saying to the seller, if the buyer can't afford this number, they're not going to buy. You can't force somebody to overpay for your practice. You can't. Lincoln freed the slaves. It's not going to happen. So your selling price has to be one that people can afford. Okay. So I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting the hook. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the message that we're trying to get out. And I've, one of the things I handed out were evaluations. Uh, feel free to fill those out. If there are additional things you'd like, let me know. If you're interested in having me send electronically that the plan to I have in Word format, I'm happy to email it to you if you're interested.